And before I begin, I'm going to start out with two apologies. So I already found out today before yesterday that I was going to be presenting this because uh, Tom Quick bailed out on me at the last minute because of a family emergency. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I am not a computer scientist. I am a mathematician who is working on this. So for the more computer science type questions, uh, I'll try my best to answer them, but if I can't come up to my answer, then I'll put you in touch with Tom and also James Davenport, who will be able to answer your questions. And I can't get this picture to work, so I'm going to stand over here. So what we did was an analysis of introductory programming courses in the UK. So there's definitely a UK focus on this talk. Um, and in the paper, there's a lot more uh, UK-related material as well splitting up the data into uh, segments of qualifications that are UK related, which I've left out here. So if you are from the UK and interested in this, there's more detail in the paper. And the purpose of this survey was to get a baseline for uh, what was happening in introductory programming courses in the UK, uh, because up till this, there was nothing done, so we didn't know who taught what programming languages, we didn't know what tools they used, we didn't know why they chose, what they chose, how happy they were with them or anything like that. Um, and in and kind of worldwide this is a trend that we don't really know what's going on outside of our own institution. So in Australia and in New Zealand they need to perform longitudinal surveys since the beginning of the 2000s where they have been surveying uh, lecturers across computer science courses to find out what they were teaching. And uh, we came across this last year when we were doing a lit review of it and decided that we had a good idea to run it in the UK. So we contacted the survey authors and we got their uh, questions for them and used those as well as we could so we could compare our answers to uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I guess the background of this is that in the UK, uh, up until now, there's been no sort of, up until 2014, I guess, there was no standardization of what school kids were learning. So some would come into university with no programming skills whatsoever, never seen any programming language, and some would be completely fluent in whatever they picked up themselves. But starting in 2014, um, uh, from the age of five, they're taught in schools. So as these school kids start to come through, there will obviously be you know, a difference in the level of students coming in the first year. And then in 2015, there's this uh, sort of regulatory uh, framework, uh, which is the teaching excellence uh, framework. So in, I think it's framework, that's the yeah, uh, Which is sort of, to sort of um, measure how universities are doing their teaching with an emphasis on student satisfaction, employability um, and, and a few other things. So with this coming in, it's kind of good to know what's actually happening, what, what are we actually teaching in university courses across the UK. And then this, the last point, the Shadbolt Review, again, that's again UK focused, so it was looking at uh, kind of the skills shortage in computer science graduates in the UK and also how they have <coughs> relatively low employability um, and a lot of complaints from industry saying that the students coming out don't have the necessary skills <coughs> required to be employed by them. So in the Shadbolt review they split up the students <coughs> by, their by their entry qualification into universities and we do uh, look at the data segmenting it by that in the paper but I didn't show it here seeing as uh, people here wouldn't, may not be as uh, familiar with the UK system. So what did we do? So we got a list of all of the computer science departments across the UK. We sent an email to their, uh, whatever email address they had, asking them to fill out this survey that we, that we created. Uh, or if not, for them to send it to the person most suitable. And that person was the person teaching first year introductory programming. So whoever that was, to send this to them and ask them to fill out. So we had 80 instructors. Well, the data I've shown actually is from 80 instructors. We actually had about 160 started, 
uh, 50 of them dropped out, and then we had a couple, we had uh, 15 cases where two people from the same course answered the survey. So those who went through by hand contacted them and asked them uh, whose answers should we actually take. And it was actually interesting to see uh, for the same course and the same institution just the difference in opinion. <laughs> I'm sure you all know. Uh, so we covered about 13,500 students, and that's excluding the open university. So in the data that I'm showing, the students uh, for the open university we've left out because obviously 3,200 is going to swamp anything that they've chosen. So, uh, so those numbers aren't in the in the rest of them. And again, we tried as closely as possible to follow the questions from the Australia and New Zealand survey. In some cases we couldn't just because it didn't make sense for us to use them, but wherever we could we did. And then we asked questions on what program language they used, the reasons for choosing that language, um, the paradigm they used, what tools they used, the reasons for using the tools, and also on um, what resources they gave the students, or the aims of teach that they wanted to fulfill in teaching their introductory programming course, how they dealt with plagiarism, etc. Um, and all of those, uh, well I'm not going to go into all of them here, they're all in the paper. So I suppose the main question we wanted to figure out was what language are people using to teach introductory programming? And for ours it was overwhelmingly that Java was the language chosen, so here I've shown on the graph um, the red is the number of language instances, so that language is chosen and then weighted by that, and then the blue is weighted by the number of students, because obviously you have some courses with just few students and some with quite a lot. Uh, then the second uh, set of bars there, the C family, is C sharp, C++, and C grouped together. Um, so out of the 100 <coughs> six language instances, so yeah, definitely Java was by far the most popular, and uh, if you look at the number of courses, it was over 60% of courses use Java, compared to only about 13% of them using Python or something like that. Um, again, most uh, courses use one language, uh, with only 17 using two, and then four using three or more. We had one course that actually used eight uh, okay. So, I so thought this was surprising for the computer science people who thought that Python would be much more popular because in the New Zealand and Australian survey, Python and Java are about the same popularity with Java increasing uh, in trend as the years go by. And then we also asked the participants so the reasons for choosing the language. And this, I suppose, maybe explains the differences between the, the top two, Java and Python. So when you look at all languages together, there are three reasons tied to being the top reason for choosing it. <coughs> so the relevance to industry, that it was an object-oriented language, and then the availability and cost to students. That's all languages grouped together. But then if you look at Java, which are the blue lines, and Python, which are the green. So Java scored highest for uh, object-oriented language and relevance to industry, whereas Python scored highest for uh, pedagogical benefits. So we, from that, you can think that they each choose Python because it's easier maybe to teach or to learn for students. But Java, I suppose, that's what they feel that industry is looking for, and so that's what they should be teaching. Again, what I should stress is these are just the opinions of the people that answer the survey, so they're not any sort of proof or anything like that. And feel free to disagree with them, if you like. <coughs> so the top reasons, again, relevance to industry, object-oriented, and availability and cost, and then that split between Java and Python. So then another thing we asked the participants was to tell us their perceived 
the perceived difficulty for the language to change all of and also the perceived usefulness. So here, um, a low answer means that it's extremely useful, extremely easy, and the high answer, the high number up to seven means extremely difficult or extremely useless. <coughs> so thankfully, nobody is teaching um, a language that they think is extremely useless, which is always good to know. And, um, but there are differences in the two across the languages. So if you look at languages like Pascal or Python, they both, both seem to be extremely easy and extremely useful. So you think they would be good languages to teach. Whereas Java, the most popular one, is actually seen as, I think it's moderate, moderately difficult. Um, and I think it's very useful. Okay, so there, you know, you can kind of question this as to why so we're using uh, Java and not this necessarily Python or something else. Uh, we then asked, so this was kind of a controversial question in the survey. We asked participants to tell us what paradigm they taught their programming course in. They were given one option, and a lot of the complaints were oh, we use more than one paradigm. We don't just teach in X, Y, or Z. And the reason we did this was to keep it the same as the Australia and New Zealand survey. So what we know is there probably should be options further than this, we did this just so we could prepare. So, um, about half of all the respondents, so 50% or 40 uh, instructors, chose object-oriented as their first choice, and then procedural and functional. And we also gave the choice of logical, but nobody chose that one. <laughs> and then we can break down each language by paradigm, but again, you have to kind of use caution when you look at this because, as I said, they could only give one um, one paradigm, but we'll say for some people and gave three <coughs> languages, so they might be using different paradigms, but we just categorize them with the one paradigm they chose. So uh, if you look again, Java is being taught uh, in OO, whereas Python is uh, overwhelmingly being taught procedurally. And that's something as well in other lit review you can see that it's used procedurally rather than uh, taught OO like Java. Uh, okay. So that's the languages. We're going to move on now to the tools. Um, and the first thing I have to say is that BlueJ, which here is the second one, the third one, sorry, that's a UK based tool <coughs> developed at UK University. So if you're not from the UK environment, you might not have heard of it. Um, but the most popular tool was definitely Eclipse, followed by No Tool, and then by BlueJ. Um, and then some of the others. And again, we looked at the reasons for choosing um, a tool. So here's the big difference again between um, BlueJ and Eclipse. So BlueJ was developed, like I said, at a university for university students to help them learn programming. Whereas Eclipse, from what I'm told, is an industry tool. Uh, so a kind of difference there. And you can see that in the reasons. <coughs> so if you look at BlueJ, what's important are pedagogical benefits, supportive material, uncomplicated ease of use. Whereas for Eclipse, it's um, availability cost to students, cross platform, relevant industry, uh, open source, etc. So definitely a, a difference there is a reason for choosing one tool over another. Um, and another kind of interesting thing is looking at the difficulty of the tools. So again, this was the perceived difficulty of using the tool for the instructor or the perceived difficulty of using the tool for the students. So again, um, kind of nice to see that the instructors are learning it easier than the students. Uh, but if you look at the difference between Eclipse and BlueJ, so Eclipse is the most popular tool by far, if you look back here, uh, but it's also been rated as the most difficult tool to learn. So maybe this is related to your last, uh, the last talk. 
maybe they should be doing something better about this uh, to teach it. Uh, so again, you kind of have to question why are people using the most difficult tool to learn, and it kind of goes back to the reasons that it's relevant to industry, so the students um, are taught it for that reason. Okay. So then, moving on, so we looked again at so aims of an introductory course. Uh, for this question, again, it wasn't uh, a list of options. People were given just a box where they could input text. We went through the text and tried to cluster them into these different uh, topics, because these were, again, were the ones used in the Australia and New Zealand survey. We wanted to be as close as possible. So some of them were easy to do, and some of them we kind of had to use our best guess as to what the instructor uh, meant. So fundamental concepts came out, um, quite lots of our 40 instructors chose this one as their top aim. They had three, they, they could write down their top three aims actually, so uh, they didn't have to give one. So problem solving and algorithmic, algorithmic thinking uh, were the top three aims given by the instructors. So we then asked uh, what resources instructors used uh, in their classes. So the first one, uh, or so most, so I think this is about 66 instructors out of 80. Um, and again, I should say for the numbers, the questions weren't mandatory in the survey, so we have different response rates for the different questions. So we tell you exactly that in the paper if you're interested. Um, so lecture slides and notes, uh, by about 66, and worked examples, textbook, um, and then just a few down at the end where maybe one or two instructors use them. And then we also asked about how instructors dealt with, um, where they thought that there was some sort of unauthorized assistance, otherwise known as plagiarism being used. So did they use some sort of plagiarism a detector of some sort of software, or did they just you know check through things by hand? Did they interview students? So the top one was uh, to notice unlikely similarities between programs. So that was the most common one, um, and using a software similarity detection was then only used by less than 30 of all of them. So not very sophisticated, I guess, uh, in this instance. Okay, so to sum up, so we did the first national survey of introductory programming for the UK. The data is actually online and open source, it's been anonymized, so some of the details aren't in it, but if you want to access it yourself, you can, it's on the University of Bath website. Um, and really what we wanted to do was just have a starting point, so the idea is to run this again, possibly every two years, to see how the landscape of introductory programming is changing and whether we will see the same trend happen in the UK that we saw in Australia and New Zealand with um, Python becoming much more popular. Um, and really, the surprise was how dominant Java was. I think, well, I had no uh, preconceptions beforehand because I had no idea what we taught in computer science uh, courses, but I know that James and Tom were both surprised that Java was as popular as it was. I think they were expecting Python or perhaps the C um, languages to be more popular than they, they came out to be. So from the opinions of the people in this survey, it seems that Python is easier for the students um, and has more benefit to them, but it's just not being taught at the moment. And the question is, again, will, will this change? So I said it's more it's about the same popularity in New Zealand and America, uh, New Zealand and Australia. In America, there was a very small-scale survey done of the top uh, 38 universe, top 38 computer science courses in the U.S., and eight out of the top 10 of them used Python. So maybe those trends will start to come into fashion in the U.K. And like I said, we will do this again so that we can see trends in the data. So I have to thank um, our collaborators in uh, Australia who provided us with the questions. Um, and also our funding, the GW4 lines. That's it, so any questions?
I, yeah, uh, I'm not sure you can actually make any sense of this chart for the reason that, uh, from the student's point of view, the, the, the perceived difficulty of the programming language is not, or at least not only depend on the language itself, but also the, the things we teach with it. Yeah. So. That's definitely interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, again, so we did these questions. These questions were really based on the New Zealand Australia survey. Whether they're the right questions to ask is another kind of topic itself. Um, and I guess you're right. Like it really does depend on what's happening in an individual course. But obviously we can't kind of analyze it at that level. So I guess you would hope that over the entire uh, UK computer science department. There would be enough kind of consistency that you could look at this. I mean, you shouldn't look at this and say, oh, definitely this is this and this is this, but it just gives you, I suppose, a flavor of what people are thinking at the moment. This is the instructors, yeah. it's not the students. It's the instructors, yeah. So it's how they think the students found it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I thought it was uh, funny to see that. Uh, the relevance to industry is an important factor for picking the language and the tool that you use. While if you look at the uh, aim of the course, fundamental concepts was on the top, while uh, career preparation was somewhere on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was wondering if there is any uh, there, it would be interesting to see the correlation between like the tool and the language they choose and our high rank. Uh, yeah, I mean another thing as well is. Like I presume in computer science it's the same that changing a course and developing a new course and changing the language and like there's a, a lot of inertia built up to be able to do that. So if you have some course kind of set in place teaching this, to then change it around to do something else, even if the individual instructor themselves might think I should be doing this, like maybe it's just not possible if they want to do it. So we were thinking of adding a question actually, um, like not like why do you not change course or what, what are the reasons for you you know changing to a different language or something like that a, a question about uh, learning analytics so i know in particular i'm not sure about bot but in the uk in particular period on this kind of organizations are very active which uh, kind of bundle the, uh, the teaching with whatever language they choose with the uh, infrastructure with a framework where uh, you know teachers can uh, see what kind of materials is read a lot, what kind of uh, material is skipped, and so forth. So it would be interesting to see whether there are different patterns or different uh, tactics among teachers of Python and teachers of Java. Have you thought of that or tried that or heard anything? Uh, no, I haven't. So I haven't heard or thought about that at all. But um, I'll definitely make an note and tell. James and Tom, I guess they would be going back to the previous question, it yeah. would be interesting to know how those languages sit in the whole overall structure of two or three years. So it's typically, I, I can envisage situations in the and I understand it's been in a situation, you teach a functional language in the first year, but as little follow through in future years, because most instructors and most materials, and like operating systems and so on, are available in the job. One of the reasons you know, you know, this, this got the position it's got is because it's the consensus of the whole department and around what they what they know, what they feel they can teach and where they're teaching to. So it'd be interesting to explore that in a bit more depth for future. Yeah, definitely. It would be interesting to know after a few years whether the choice of language has any difference at all. When you learn first learn a language, it doesn't matter which one you learn. And whether uh, this survey is going to be able to answer that question after a certain number of years. Yeah. Whether, whether basically it cripples the mind. Mm -hmm. Whether just learning how to program is the important thing, or whether learning where the braces go is important. Yeah, so we weren't, like, there's no, nothing here about how the students did afterwards. Like, we don't have any data on that. I mean, doing that, like, would in theory be possible, but it would be a much bigger um, kind of research projects, you have to think of, you know, uh, privacy and things like that for the students themselves. But, I mean, in theory you could kind of connect those two to see, oh, these students are learning this, and they're doing this well, these students are doing this, etc. But it's not something we did here. 
but definitely, I know it is of interest because in all the like the papers and the literature, I mean that seems to be one of the biggest questions. I was wondering if there's uh, if there are any other major differences between uh, the UK and the, the survey that's been running in Australia and New Zealand for a number of years, other than Python popularity. Um, so the difference between that and then the differences in the tools, so they use a completely different tool as their first choice. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's again, it's there. Um, and obviously they don't, some of the tools they didn't have in there because they're UK ones. Um, other than that, there is, so we did actually, uh, go with, uh, collaborate with the uh, researchers in Australia and New Zealand to, to do a combined paper showing ours versus theirs. Um, I think that's kind of in development at the moment. But I guess you can see the difference in that. Yeah. <coughs> so you had this survey, and you asked questions about which programming language and which tool, which should be taught. So were there open questions, or did you have a list of so they were a list of, of the top 20, but then there was always an option like other and fill it in by hand. So that they could add in their own language if we had to call it or two or whatever. And most of the boxes had comment boxes. So people could say, this is a stupid question or um, do you have any idea how those results are correlated with the results of the students on tests and with the further career of the students, whether uh, students that got, got Java were actually better in programming or had uh, better results on their marks? And uh, no, so we didn't. We have not. We have no idea what the students got or how they performed in their exams or after or anything. Um, it was really just on what's being taught, not how well they're doing. Um, I mean, you could do this, but I, I think it would be just a lot of work to be able to link that back. Yeah, but I think those results are also important for the professors to know what, what will give the best result, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so all of these results are online that an individual professor <coughs> could look up and see. But I mean, they'll only get their own one, so... Yeah. Okay. And 